One of the greatest misconceptions some Israelites convey toward the concept of monogamy is that it was concocted by Europeans to fragment black communities while simultaneously facilitating and augmenting the systemic exploits and power dynamics of white supremacy. Although this matriarchal Babylonian kingdom is satanic, those who credit Europeans for inventing monogamy dismiss one contradiction. Polygyny will actually strengthen the hand of white supremacists through the landscape and tentacles of this matriarchal beast system. For example, it is common sense that if polygyny was widely accepted, the government could make more money through divorce settlements more than through monogamy. The cooperation and submissiveness of the woman is influenced by matriarchal cohorts, but determined by the woman. Matthew 7.16 says, By their fruits you will know them. In other words, a generation of whoremongering women who do not keep their virgin for one man show you they are not worthy of polygyny anymore. We don't look at the men because men were not defiled by the serpent's seed in the beginning. Because those who champion polygyny argue that the Most High would not have created men to produce offspring deep into his years if he did not want him to practice polygyny perpetually. Well, I will counter that again with fruit. First of all, the power of self-control lies in the overcoming of temptation. That's just like saying God created the woman to be the most beautiful among all his creatures. Therefore, she should exploit this gift with different men. God has given athletes the gift to make millions playing professional sports, knowing that men will exalt themselves as gods in turn. <laughs> I mean, I can go on and on. It would not be a sacrifice if the thing we sacrifice is not appealing to the flesh. Because if men spent all his years producing seed, he would never fast and he would never present his body a living sacrifice to the Lord. And actually, the older you get, the more you're supposed to fast because fasting is death and you're moving closer to death. During the transatlantic slave trade, our people were not able to do either. They were not permitted to establish an altar and worship the Most High whenever they wanted, and they could produce as many sons as they want, but those boys were auctioned to the white man's plantation. Is that being fruitful and multiply? No. Joel 3 verse 3 says they gave a boy as payment for a harlot. So producing seed is a blessing and a curse. Producing fruit is more important than producing seed. What's the point of producing a whole bunch of babies if they grow old and face the eternal wrath of God? So we cannot look at polygyny through the lens of producing seed. It's all about producing fruits. The fruit is in the field and is picked from a tree. The field of women are mostly harlots today. You cannot turn a harlot into a housewife. In Matthew 16:4. Christ said, this is a wicked and adulterous generation. In 1 Corinthians 7 verse 2, Paul said, because of sexual immorality, let every man have his own wife and every woman her own husband. In other words, it is immoral not only for a man to lay with another man's wife, but for the people in that city to allow that man an adulterous woman to live. Remember, the Apostle Paul said, the letter of the law killeth. The law of jealousy killeth. But Paul understood through the Spirit of Christ that there is no way you can fulfill this law under captivity to the Romans. And those who support polygyny cannot use King Solomon because you got to look at his fruit, not his seed. Look at King Solomon's fruit. Despite the flaws of King Solomon's escapades, he had 700 wives and all of them had to be virgins exclusive to him. I mean, think about that. That is one of the greatest testaments against this modern counterfeit practice of polygyny. Here's the king of Israel with 700 wives 
all of them virgins, and all of them subjected to the law of jealousy, meaning if any one of them committed adultery, they would be stoned to death. That was the pinnacle of patriarchal rule that does not exist today. When did the law end? When Christ manifested in the flesh. Let's go to John chapter 8, verse 1 through 12. Verse 1, it says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So he was basically writing out their sins, possibly in some sand, so that they could read it, and they were convicted. So he's setting them up here. Verse 7, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Verse 11, she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Verse 12, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That's how you know also that Jesus Christ is God. A man cannot forgive sins. Even though the Pharisees were convicted of their sins, Jesus Christ is the only one that can forgive sins on earth. So if he was just a regular man, he cannot speak to them with that authority. That's why they were convicted in their conscience. Because man was made in the image and likeness of God. The scriptures say we, we, we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, so Christ just nullified the law right there. What they don't talk about is how polygyny went away also. So there's a law of grace. The woman was given grace, but under the law of Moses, she wouldn't have been given that grace because she's bound to the law. The letter of the law killeth. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's obviously not the case today, despite the fact that white supremacists practice this with their penal system. They do eye for an eye, for the most part. And remember in the scriptures, which I'll touch on later, scriptures say, judge not that you be not judged also. That's what that's talking about. <laughs> it's talking about those who actually take life for life, or God will take your life, or he will judge you in the great white throne judgment, okay? Because not everyone get their judgment in this time. So anyway, when Christ said what he said up to that point, again, women were being stoned to death for adultery. Christ didn't say she has the option to be a man's concubine. See, you polygynists can't have your cake and eat it too. Why did Christ take away that part of the law that would sanction a death penalty to adulterers, knowing that was the only deterrent to the perpetual practice of adultery? Because he was already in the midst of an adulterous generation. They could no longer keep the law of Moses because they were no longer putting people to death. Furthermore, more importantly, not practicing the sacrifices, the consecrations, because Jerusalem had already went into captivity. Also, again, Jesus Christ, who is God, he knew the transatlantic slave trade was in store for the Israelites. And many whoredoms and abominations would be committed 
against his chosen people. So in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is reiterating what Christ conveyed in John chapter 8, Matthew 7, 16, and Matthew 16, 4. Divorce and abortion and promiscuity is the fruit of this adulterous generation. Again, we're looking at the state of the woman. We're looking at fruits, okay? We're looking at the virtue of the woman, along with the consecrations and the penal system sanctioned under the law of Moses to determine the sanctity of polygyny. And at this point in the teaching, I will segue into how this relates to white supremacy. So abortion, divorce, and promiscuity, I've already established, these are the fruits of this adulterous matriarchal age. But white supremacy spearheaded all of this wickedness. And again, the first layer of the matrix is white supremacy. And because white supremacists are fraudulent in their interpretation of the scriptures, they lied about Matthew chapter 7, 1 through 3, that judgment is to verbally rebuke someone of the sin you practice. Therefore, that person's being a hypocrite. No, it doesn't only refer to that. It refers to changing or compromising the life or even taking the life of someone because you're judging them for a sin that they committed. That's what Matthew 7, 1 through 3 is referring to primarily. But in John chapter 8, the scribes and Pharisees were about to judge the adulterous woman. They were about to judge her by putting her to death. Now, ask this. Why did white supremacists pacify the real meaning of judgment? Because every day they judge men according to their own penal code, and they are hypocrites. But before I elaborate further, let me address those of you white folks who are righteous. Your righteousness cannot stand in place as a ransom for the overhaul of wickedness of your forefathers and all that they have done and the evil this generation of Edomites continue to incorporate. The blood of Jesus does not cover the sin they wish to live in the comforts of their homes off the bloodshed of our forefathers. Okay? The blood of Jesus covers repentance. Well, what about the black people? Listen, we were judged for our disobedience with the transatlantic slave trade and all the afflictions of the prison industrial complex, eugenics, castration, Jim Crow, and so much more. Reading from Jeremiah 15.1, it says, Then the Lord said to me, this is Jeremiah the prophet speaking, Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable toward this people. Talking about the Jews. He continues, he says, send them out of my sight. You see that? Even the righteousness of Jesus Christ, although it does redeem man's sins through repentance, the men who are reprobate and continue to practice wickedness without repenting, the blood of Jesus don't cover them. They go straight to the lake of fire. So. That's a word for you so-called righteous white folk. Okay, no man's righteousness. The scriptures say all our, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Okay, you got to pay for the sins of your forefathers. This is why Christ emphasized death to self in the new covenant, because he understood the burden of the sins of our forefathers, which according to Deuteronomy 5, 9, passed down up to the third and fourth generation. So let's read from Luke chapter 14, verse 26 through 33. It says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, this does not mean literally hate them. Okay, it just means if the unfortunate time comes where that line in the sand is drawn, between your relationship with them and your relationship with the Most High, you better choose the Most High. Okay, he said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father who is in heaven. Okay, I've been tested with this many times, many times in my life. I kid you not. Verse 27, 
And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's deep stuff. And remember, he also said your righteousness must exceed the Pharisees. And remember, the Pharisees were self-righteous because they were fasting. Okay, the sacrifices of God is a broken and contrite spirit. So instead of making your claim that you had nothing to do with the sins of your forefathers, you understand that Proverbs 631 says if the thief is found, he must restore sevenfold. So if you know there was death, there's documented proof that reparations are owed. The bill is passed down to you. And that's what most white supremacists don't understand is that man cannot outlive his sins. His sins are passed down to his children. Okay. The book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 12, says, Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed and establishes a city by iniquity. It does not say anything about the man who committed the initial offense because the Most High understand that man's life is only a vapor, according to Giants chapter 4, verse 14, and Job 14, 1 and 2, which says, Man is fewer days and full of trouble, okay? So, again, man cannot outlive his sins. So, the Most High got to do what? He got to pass it down to his children. You got to understand blood covenants. Isaiah 13, 16 says, Their children will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered, and their wives ravished. This is where many will wonder how and why the Most High will allow the infants, the newborns, to be dashed to pieces. Well, we know the precious, innocent children go to heaven to be with him. The Most High is able to remove their precious soul from their body before harm comes to the flesh. So you're probably wondering, what's the point of this? Who is this hurting? Their children being dashed before their eyes. It is a torment to live in the memory of the parents, those Edomites who gave a boy for a harlot. You got to read the scriptures. This is why Revelation 9, 6 says, man will seek death and not find it. All these scriptures are tied to Matthew 7, 1 through 3 and John chapter 8. Judgment is reserved for our oppressors and their descendants who judge for the sake of unrighteous mammon. White supremacy is a packaged deal. The books got to be balanced and your debt is unsettled. Some have called for reparations, which will not suffice. Some things just got to be paid back in blood. Okay. Yes, if the reparations were paid, maybe the most high. And if they repented, maybe the most high wouldn't make this judgment harsh. But the fact that it's written in the scriptures is telling. Okay, it has to come to pass if it's written in the scriptures because the Most High cannot lie. Okay, let's read from Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32 through 35. It says, verse 32, Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Wounds and dishonor he will get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. For jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give many gifts. Some things cannot be spared 
in the day of vengeance. When the Gentiles scattered our people, called themselves by our name, and stole our homeland, we were no longer able to practice polygyny and all the consecrations God established for us under the law of Moses. So this right here, Proverbs 6, 32 through 35, is sort of a replicate of the Most High's jealousy because the Most High is a husband and Israel is his bride, his chosen people, his jewels. So those who committed adultery with her, raped her in the transatlantic slave trade, they're going to have to deal with the husband's fury. You see how the scriptures are cryptic? This is also why I do not recommend interracial marriages, which is a big part of this matrix deception. Our women fell in love with their oppressors due to self-hatred, which is idolatry. Also, you must understand that the judgments coming upon these heathen Edomites will not be spared just because they marry blacks or move into some common unity with blacks. If you have children with these heathens and they did not sell everything they own because it is cursed with innocent bloodshed, according to Deuteronomy 5, 9, the Most High visits this iniquity onto the children up to the third and fourth generations. Okay, it doesn't matter if they're mixed kids or if they're white. Okay, I hope you can see how polygyny was compromised by the transatlantic slave trade, but it is not the only sabotage to this practice. To hear more about how polygyny became perverted, watch my series titled Polygyny is a Package Deal. All right. Do I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? It's not personal. It's scripture. Okay. Don't let your flesh write checks. Your soul cannot cash in the afterlife. It's all about fates and gates. You got to have faith and you're going to need God's grace.